Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the kind introductory words, David. Um, before we start, I would actually like to thank all of you uh, for having me here today, thanks to the CCDS and uh, Owen in particular, who makes the talks available on YouTube. I have been a devoted follower of this series for quite some time now. Uh, but when I started to watch the first videos back in Germany a few years ago, I certainly did not imagine that I would get the chance to spend half, of, half a year here at CCDS um, and be invited to come back to give this talk. So I'm, I'm very honored and I would like to thank David Bold, but also the entire uh, CCDS team uh, for their generosity and hospitality um, throughout my multiple stays here at Hope. Um, Yesterday we went to Eaton Place and it almost felt like coming home to a second home instead of being on an official work trip. So um, thank you all for creating this, this very welcoming environment. Am I loud enough? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, today I would like to introduce and contemplate a question that has accompanied me ever since I started working on my PhD project three years ago which is entitled, so that's the title of the PhD project, um, Becoming Disabled, Multimodal Mediations of Trauma and Disability in 21st Century American Literature. In this project, which is still in progress, I focus on what I call transitional disability narratives, narratives that feature a disabled protagonist who either acquires or just recently acquired a bodily or sensory impairment. Uh, my project's title, Becoming Disabled, thus refers to these characters' process of dealing both with the changes of their bodies as well, of course, as with their altered status in society due to these uh, bodily changes. At first glance, these narratives often seem to promote what has come to be known as a tragic model of disability. And I know you're all familiar with that model where disability is made out to be the tragic fate of an individual rather than a socioculturally constructed phenomenon. Trying to look beyond the negative responses that transitional disability narratives have traditionally evoked in disability studies scholarship, I, however, found that uh, an in-depth analysis of more recently published um, transitional disability narratives revealed the complexities and the intersectional relation of disability, trauma, and loss that frequently lies at the heart of these stories. So taking these intersections into account, I could further find that while the process of becoming disabled is frequently portrayed as a tragic experience, the overall narratives do not necessarily render disability as tragic. So often it's more the accident as such, the sudden illness, maybe also loss of a family member, something that goes along this process of becoming disabled that is really the core of the trauma and disability is often actually represented in quite uh, complex manners and not just in tragic ways. I have to add here that my analysis is not only limited to books but to specific types of books that have been particularly successful in recent years, namely the graphic memoir and other forms of comics and multimodal narratives that are told in a realist mode. So for my research I read about 150 books um, by now, but for my close readings I decided to focus on four of them that are representative of different genres that I'm analyzing. So I'm, I'm looking at young adult fiction, at postmodern experimentalism, at war novels, and um, at graphic medicine. Today I will mainly focus on uh, graphic medicine, but I will try to tackle a question that has actually caught my attention throughout reading all of these books. So if you are interested in any of the other genres, please feel free and invited to ask questions. Um, about these other genres if, if you would like to talk uh, about them as well. I am interested, as uh, David Feeney already pointed out, in the specific 
aesthetics that underlie graphic narratives of illness and disability. So what kind of effective and emotional responses do these narratives that rely on the visual mode produce? What cultural work is done by these multimodal negotiations of disability? These questions have, as I already mentioned, um, they accompanied me from the very beginning of my PhD. It was, however, a more recent event that brought me to realize just what kind of effect and effect graphic illness and disability narratives can generate. So um, back in October last year, I visited the Graphic Medicine Conference, um, one of the first in Germany. The conference took place at the Charité in Berlin. I don't know if anyone knows the Charité. It's the largest uh, university clinic in Europe and it's very famous for all its Nobel Prize winners <coughs> and its very high competitiveness. So going there, I was extremely excited as the conference did not only bring to together literary scholars, medical professionals and comics artists alike, but was also complemented by what sounded like a very promising exhibition at the Charité's Museum, a museum sorry, of medical history. Uh, featuring some of the comics and the presenters would then later on talk about. So when I went to the exhibition, exhibition's vernissage on the first night of the conference, I was surprised to find that my reaction to the exhibition was quite different from what I had expected it to be. Walking into a room full of aisles with ana anatomical specimens on them, the walls at the end of each aisle would each show an enlarged comic, a comic dealing with the experience of illness and disability <coughs> from the perspective of the patient. And I brought some pictures of the exhibition to give you an impression. Um, so on the left picture you can see, or can you actually see, is that, yeah, okay. Uh, um, yeah, so on the left, picture you can see aisles full of jars that compromise human specimen and replica of body parts and on the right picture there is one of the featured comics entitled Broken Eggs that as the title already suggests deals with uh, reproductive rights and treatments and I also uh, if anyone interested I brought the catalog so if you want to look at the other comics um, please feel free to ask me after my talk. So the exhibition was called Sick, Krank sein im Comic. So that's the German title, the English title is Reclaiming Illness Through Comics. While I find the basic premise of the exhibition to create a personalized counter narrative to the otherwise depersonalized medical narrative presented by the jars of human specimens striking, the interventionist function of these comics was undermined, at least in my opinion, by the main exhibit. After all, visitors have to walk along each aisle of human specimen in order to truly look at and read the featured comics. Going down each of the aisles myself, I could not help but feel uncomfortable. A feeling that reached its peak when I encountered an aisle with a number of stillborn babies on it babies who, due to their various so-called deformities, had become public exhibits, neatly conserved in individual jars. Although I was at a medical facility, I was thrown off by this very particular um, medicalized encounter with disability, and I indeed was not entirely able to shake off this feeling and my own emotional response of discomfort over the next three days of the conference. There are so many good things to tell about the conference that I'm feeling a little bad now mentioning only this, um, this encounter. Um, what I however noticed is that with all the enthusiasm that I and the other conference participants sh share for graphic illness and disability narratives, we miss to discuss some of the potential downsides that the merging of medicine and comics as well as the overemphasizing of the visual mood can actually have. So during my talk today, 
I thus want to problematize some of the cultural assumptions which I believe form the basis for the current popularity of graphic illness and disability narratives and their use within the medical training. Among other things, I aim to question the ocular centrism that takes effect whenever visual modes of storytelling are privileged in order to create emotional and thus supposedly meaningful responses to disability. So uh, here's my outline in order to discuss these issues. I will first of all introduce you a little more in detail to the term graphic medicine and elaborate a little bit on the success that this new field has had over the last years. And then at the second step I will go on to debate how the visualization of disability in comics can actually be linked to medicine's general reliance on visual culture and how I think this reliance on images raises some very important questions about the effects and effects that graphic disability narratives generate due to their multimodality. I would like to stress that everything I'm presenting is still work in progress, so um, I'm very much looking forward to your comment and if you have some very critical comments, please go ahead and tell me because that's that's what I'm looking for. Um, I, I'm really um, looking forward and welcoming all ideas and thoughts that you might have. So, depending on the country, the comics medium has or continues to be understood first and foremost as a part of children's entertainment, with the general public being rather unaware of the range of content and genres that are covered by comics. And I know that's really different in different countries, but I, I think you might agree that the first thing that people mostly associate with comics is superheroes, right? Some of you are nodding, okay. Um, yeah, in Germany that's definitely what they associate with comics. It is thus surprising and, as I would add, quite exciting as well, that over the past decade, autobiographical comics have not only begun to notably gain popularity by a wider public, but have also started to receive recognition from literary critics and academics. It is one specific, specific type of comics, the graphic illness memoir, also called pathographic, that has furthermore sparked in, in, in unprecedented interest in comics by health professionals. To give a name to this new interest and to denote the role that comics can play in the study and delivery of healthcare, Ian William, a physician himself as well as a writer and comic artist, coins the term graphic medicine. And I don't know if anyone reading The Guardian. Um, yeah, Ian William is actually, you might be familiar with a series of comic strips called The Sick Note. Um, he is the author of that. Uh, series in The Guardian. So graphic medicine as a new interdisciplinary field of research, further established by American scholars such as Michael Queen and Kimberly Meyer, no longer focuses on a therapeutic utilization of comics alone, but sheds light on pathography's potential function within medical education, patient care, and uh, this seems particularly interesting for us as disability study scholars, the social critique of the medical profession. As the term graphic medicine might be a little misleading, I would like to add that Ian Williams himself has noted that, um, quote, graphic medicine is also a pun. It's not just about medicine as in medicine pertaining to doctors, but also medicine given on a spoon, a kind of curative for medicine. In 2015, William published the Graphic Medicine Manifesto together with practitioners and scholars from a range of different fields, including cultural and literary studies. And I brought the cover with me um, to give you an impression. So the cover shows the comic of a comic avatars of two English professors from Penn State University, um, Scott Smith and Susan Squire standing among the other authors who all have a medical gear on. So the, the one um, comic figure who wears the jeans and 
the t-shirt that's Scott Smith and the chicken is uh, Susan Squire. So that's a really interesting comic avatar. If you want to hear the whole story, just ask me afterwards. It's quite interesting. Um, taking together the six individual essays of this manifesto, I think it's quite fair to say that the field of graphic medicine can perhaps be best understood as an effort to trans transform the practice of medicine through the use of mainly autobiographical comics. What is clear is that there is certainly no lack in autobiographical comics that might be used in this endeavor. By now, the official graphic medicine website gathered a list of over 150 published works. And here is the uh, official website address and some of the books in the background lying on a table. Um, so there are published books, there are also a series of web comics and comics that are originally published in a, other, in a different language than English. Among the lists are New York Times bestsellers um, here are the covers, um, like David Small Stitches, Marissa Marchetto's Cancer Vixen, Alan Fernie's Marbles, David B's Epileptic, and Sarah Levitt's Tangles. And that's just a collection of very um, popular ones that I would also always recommend reading. These are really, really good uh, works of, um, of auto, of life writing. Their success is indicative of the general graphic memoir boom that graphic illness and disability narratives are part of. In the US, the so-called graphic novel indeed has become the fastest growing category within the literary market. The boom of graphic memoirs must, of course, also be understood as a successor of the memoir boom in general and the disability memoir boom in particular that Thomas Kauser, for instance, has written widely about. As a specific type of memoir, graphic memoirs of illness and disability focus on the bodily limitations that their protagonists experience during and or following times of illness. Most of the memoir's protagonists fall ill unexpectedly and acquire a disability due to their illness. The memoirs thus frequently negotiate sudden and disruptive experiences of pain and violence, which result from the protagonist's physical limitations, as well as from the reactions and actions of their social surrounding. A heightened interest in these comics can not only be noted in the UK and US, but can also be detected in other countries. So by now, they have a Spanish sister side of the medical, um, dot com and uh, also the Pasographics network that's established in um, in Germany that's very striking because Germany doesn't have a very long uh, history or tradition of comics compared to the UK and the US so that's really something that's booming right now but why the specific interest in comics by health professionals the authors of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto argue that comics about illness and disabilities can encourage further doctors and health professionals to become more self-reflexive in their work. Pathographies they propose allow health professionals to shift perspective, to see health, illness and medical encounters from the perspective of the patient, as well as they allow the common reader to learn more about certain conditions or to know that there are people out there um, who share the same experiences. Of course, the idea that medical practice is in dire need of change and that such change might be brought about through the use of autobiographical narratives is nothing new and I, I think we all agree on that. Um, medical schools in the US have indeed been using life writing as well as fictional literature in their curricular for the last 30 years. While the medical school curriculum for most of the 19th and 20th century deliberately excluded the patient perspective in an effort to manifest medical authority, the so-called literature and medicine movement reintroduced the patient perspective in medical education starting with the teaching of solely text-based pieces of life writing in the 1980s. This form of narrative medicine that can be seen as a precursor of graphic medicine 
has been described by Rita Sharon as a practice of medicine that includes the narrative skills of recognizing, absorbing, interpreting, and being moved by the stories of illness. And I think it's very interesting that Rita Sharon, one of the defining figures of narrative medicine, uh, already talks here about this act of being moved as a skill that doctors also need to um, acquire. This observation, of course, runs counter to the fact that doctors are usually bound to a narrative um, genre that tries to avoid or even erase any kinds of emotions, namely the case study. So, although we live in a time of great medical progress, Doctors often lack the human capacities to recognize the plights of their patient. And as literary scholar and a physician herself, Sharon admits that the task of truly listening to patients can actually be quite demanding. But what she also acknowledges is that the patient's task of telling is often much more difficult um, because some embodied experiences and emotions are not easily or even impossible to put into words. For us today this seems crucial because for one it helps us to situate graphic medicine in this tradition of narrative medicine and even more importantly so because scholars in the field of graphic medicine frequently promote the use of comics in patient care and in medical education claiming that these comics can actually narrate precisely that what cannot be put into words. So as one of the leading scholars in the field, Susan Squire, for instance, remarks, um, I quote, uh, that graphic narratives show us things that can't be said, just as they can narrate experiences without relying on words. And in their juxtaposition of words and pictures, they can also convey a far richer sense of the different magnitudes at which we experience any performance of illness, disability, medical treatment, or healing." Quote end. In a similar vein, Michael Goldenberg recently argued in a medical journal, actually the journal for no throat and ears, that was interesting read for me, uh, so he argued that one of the benefits of using comics instead of traditional text-only print material is that images touch us differently emotionally. Indeed, one of his other articles is entitled, A Picture Says More Than a Thousand Hertz. So the common phrase that this title derives from, A Picture Says More Than a Thousand Words, actually can be found repeatedly within the literature on graphic medicine. Yet while this seems to be a common um, claim and a common phrase, I, I think you're all familiar with it, uh, some of the given explanation to actually justify this claim seem rather unconvincing. Talking about the effective power of images and the privileging of images, Goldenberg, for instance, write, and I quote, You often go to the movies and see people with tears streaming down their cheeks, but you don't often see this reaction in libraries. That's his explanation. Uh, and I have to admit that I find this line of argumentation a bit amusing, uh, since for someone working in hard science, his evidence seems to stand on rather shaky grounds. Um, of course, books can also move us emotionally. And furthermore, as scholars like um, Martin Eslin have shown for the theater, our emotional responses to movies depend on many sensory phenomena, for instance on music, uh, quite a lot actually. And the fact that in movie theaters uh, you are also affected by responses of others around you, so when someone is starting to laugh you might be uh, inclined to also laugh, that's something he completely leaves out there when he makes this argument. Um, building on Scott McCloud's groundbreaking work in comic studies, a more convincing explanation that Goldenberg offers is that emotional connection is enhanced by exploiting the icon. An image used to present a person, place, thing or idea, the icon conveys information as well as emotion because by simplifying it provokes identification in the reader. 
I brought you an icon that you're all familiar with, a smiley face, uh, that hopefully conveys a feeling of happiness. And uh, as you can see, the style is so abstract and everyone can actually identify with it. It's not male, it's not racialized, so everyone can actually relate to the smiley face. Furthermore, comics require the reader's participation on two levels. They have to perform closure between each panel and they receive information in two different modes. Thus, engagement with the information is increased, allowing, as Goldenberg notes, a flow of emotional and intellectual attachment. Thus, the argument goes, and that's what he concludes, uh, I quote, comics may give the medical provider a different insight into the patient's emotional state and, in turn, provide more thorough and empathetic care. And all of these are not just some theoretical complica uh, com contemplations, but really have affected medical practice. And I just collected a few examples from uh, medical journals uh, that show that comics are being used in both general and medical education, as well as in patient care, and have been found beneficial in various aspects. So the first article uh, is on educating medical students, the second is on mediating the difficult emotional state after diagnostic mistakes, the, th the third one is on showing examples of good and bad medicine and how to avoid any mistakes, and the fourth article on this list here is on allowing children to understand their participation in medical research. So the use of comics in medicine is well documented in different medical journals and also includes the Journal of, uh, American Medi of the American Medical Asso Association, uh, which started to even feature a best of list of comics every year. So there you have this medical journey and they are now having those best of comics every, every, um, every year. That's very interesting. What we can learn from these publications is that graphic medicine generates a number of disability effects. On an intradiegetic level, comics are used to represent the feelings of a person experiencing illness and disability. At the same time, on an extradiegetic level, these comics are used to influence the feelings of the reader, disabled or not, in their encounter with disability. While I do not want to, and I want to stress this, I don't want to speak against this use of comics, but I would like to argue that the same can be achieved by solely text-based literature, as has been shown by readers' responses to highly acclaimed memoirs such as Audre Lorde's Cancer Journals. What I hope to have shown with my elaborations so far is that while much has been written on what comics can be used for, only very little has been said on what might be the limits or potential disadvantage of using them. So next to the very obvious issue of accessibility, so who can actually read comics um, and who is excluded from reading them, my findings in this regard are twofold. Many of the illness and disability memoirs that I've read offer a complex and productive mediation on how disability and the embodied experience of disability matter. However, as Scott Pierre points out in his analysis of the bestseller Stitches, most of the graphic illness and disability memoirs I've read are rather reluctant to make more of an argument about the relationship between their form and disability. So extending Pierre's argument, I would thus like to propose that the field of graphic medicine would really benefit from a more rigorous reflection on the relation between disability and the comics medium itself. Which brings me to a very broad, but I think a very important question. Precisely what do we look at when we look at images of disability in these comics? Looking at processes of becoming disabled, we are frequently invited to look at experiences of suffering, of disruption of life by illness or accidents. It is particularly this autobiographical engagement with trauma, I argue, that continues to generate both scholars and the public's fairly new interest in the comics medium.
Given the opportunity to look at the visualized trauma of others, a major appeal of graphic memoirs of disability and illness lies in their satisfaction of a voyeuristic desire. While the, red, while the rhetorical paradigm of the postmodern West has been defined by scholars as a rhetoric of perfection, so a rhetoric that focuses very much on individual ability to control and perfect one's own body and life, loss of agency has become ever more of a spectacle. This is, of course, also not something entirely new. As Susan Sontag already asserts, I think in 1973, in her book on photography, I quote, a society which makes it normative to aspire never to experience privation, failure, misery, pain, dread, disease, and in which death itself is regarded not as natural and inevitable, but as a cruel, unmerited disaster, creates a tremendous curiosity about these events, a curiosity that is partly satisfied through picture taking. Sontag tries to capture the omnipresence of images and our fascination with photographs of pain and disaster by creating the notion of the image world. And I actually think we live more in an image world nowadays than back in the 70s when she wrote the book. Beyond the extensive use of photography and film that Sontag critically observes, this image world continues to manifest itself in the use of images in literature. The urge to visualize and look at experiences of trauma, illness, and disability is thus embedded in a discourse that uses images to distinguish the traumatized and disabled other from the normative reader it imagines. Because of their visual layer and their content, graphic memoirs of illness and disability are by their nature concerned with and bound up in the politics of representation, challenging or reinforcing the normalizing stare of their implied readers. The visual overdetermination of disability allows a predominantly non-disabled audience to, to stare at the other in order to manifest its own normative status. And I brought Something. Yeah, I brought uh, examples from uh, stitches that really show the overdetermination, uh, the visual overdetermination of disability, since the protagonist actually uh, becomes mute due to his illness. So that would be an invisible disability, right? But here we are allowed to look at the missing vocal cord and uh, also at the scar that is shown multiple times throughout the comic. The depiction of disability in graphic narratives of trauma, whether intentionally or unintentionally, relies on traditional viewing habits while missing out on the positive effect that the stare can have in interpersonal encounters. Um, that's what Rosemary Gala Thompson elaborates on in staring, and you all are probably familiar with that. Um, it is precisely due to the common belief that some experiences cannot be put into words but put into images that disability and becoming disabled mainly remain something to be looked at. I propose that these normative practices of looking and staring need to be considered whenever graphic memoirs of trauma and disability are analyzed. And I would like to make another argument here um, using stitches. Um, Stitches visualizes a number of childhood traumas, so from physical and psychological abuse to an unknown cancer diagnosis, and I argue that it thus offers its reader a feeling of exemption. Uh, such a feeling initiates, as Susan Sontag argues, the interest to look at painful images as much as a mere look at them reinforces the notion of exemption as such. Ah, okay. Here we go. Um, so I quote, the feeling of being exempt from calamity stimulates <coughs> interest in looking at painful pictures and looking at them suggests and strengthens the feeling that one is exempt. Partly it is because one is here and not there and partly it is the character of innovate, in the, uh, can someone help me? 
inevitability, thank you, <laughs> that all events acquire when they are transmuted into images. Translating this to illness and disability comics, I would argue that the popularity of graphic illness and disability narratives is partly due to the fact that readers tend to and are culturally trained to derive a certain pleasure from looking at pictures of pain, disability and illness because these images, particularly if they are as extreme as in stitches, also hold this kind of reinsurance for the reader that this is not them. So, one could argue, of course, that Sontag talks about photography and I'm talking about <laughs> comics, so what am I actually doing here? Um, indeed, cartoons and photography, for instance, are defined by the comic scholar Scott McCloud as opposite types of images via via their degree of abstraction. And yeah, I have another example from uh, Stitches where we can see the protagonist and if we look closely at how he is actually depicted we can see it's not a lot of detail but rather it is rather an abstract and cartoonish style that's enforced even by him drawing a cartoon character on a piece of paper. Um, the iconic abstraction that is used to fictionalize the characters and settings and stitches does not utilize the claim of authenticity that falsely accompanies photographs. Instead, the graphic memoir uses the iconic abstraction of its character to invite the stare of those readers who, with regard to the content, might feel reluctant to directly stare at overly realistic images of David's ill and subsequently disabled body. Such potential restraints are loosened by the fictionality that Stitch's stylistic approach, a cartoonish style of drawing, achieves. So while some of you, I, I certainly, while I'm reluctant looking at some photographs, or um, just take my example of the museum at the, at the real uh, human specimen, I feel fine looking at these images because that's just cartoon, right? That's just, or it's just comics drawing. Makes me feel more comfortable. Um, unlike photographs, which are frequently perceived as witnesses themselves, Stitch's extra diegetic author, however, functions as paratextual witness and thus as a means of authentication. So while this seems quite fictionalized and cartoonish, we still have the knowledge, oh, but it's a true story. So we get both. We get the true, apparently, supposedly true thing, but we also get the distance and comfort of looking at comics instead of uh, photographs. In doing so, Small Stitches profits from the unsteady line between fictional and non-fictional word that the graphic memoir itself blurs. While it is suggested through the titling of Stitches as memoir, and thus through an autobiographical pact with the reader that the protagonist's story can be traced back to real life, the visual fic fictionalization allows for a safe distance. Secondly, I would like to argue that the multimodal approach used in comics further draws attention to and exploits the visuality of disability. After all, comics create a constant confrontation with the materiality of the body. In sequential art, the ever-present image of the body becomes a material reality as well as a fundamental feature of characterization. Indeed, comics have a long and controversial history of using markers of bodily differences in order to characterize their protagonists. Supposedly racial differences and physical marks have long served as stand-in for moral, political or socio-economic difference. This practice has been most popular in the era which saw the medical sideshow flourishing, yet is, as scholars like Zach Wallen, Chris Foss, and Jonathan Cray have noted, still far from having completely vanished. According to an analysis of a large sample of graphic narratives by Marilyn Irwin and Robin Muller, disability is still largely used to define characters in graphic narratives rather than disability being considered only one embodied aspect of a character's individual trait. 
due to their medium and their specific narrative focus, graphic illness and disability memoirs share this visual overemphasis on the body. It is because of this visual hyperbolism that comics are, as Rosemary Garlett Thompson argues, um, always graphic freak shows filled with spectacles and thrills. Because of this reliance on the spectacle, multimodal narratives manifest disability as a concept that has traditionally been visually overdetermined. And that leads me to a third point, a claim made within graphic medicine that I quote, autopathography is a radically new form of communicating disease. In quite opposition, I would argue that graphic illness and disability narratives are by no means radical in using visual representations of illness, disability and the body. In separate studies, med medical historians like Marilyn Bourreur and Stanley Ryer have shown that the institution of physiology as a medical discipline indeed went right along with the development of mechanical techniques and instruments for the graphic registration of bodily processes. So well before the cinematography, before photographs and x-rays, everything that we know nowadays, uh, Lisa Cartwright further reminds us that psychi physi physio physiologists developed visual instruments to depict the course of normal and pathological processes. So even previous to our modern technology, we had instruments um, or instruments existed that, for instance, would render the pulse visible, record muscular contractions via images, or visually trace the heartbeat. So I thus propose that the fascination evoked by illness and disability comics is related to a medical fascination to understand the body through visual means. So just think about my example of the museum. Uh, when we go to a museum, we will encounter visual uh, representations of the body, while text will mainly be like there to contemplate, uh, to complement, complement the actual exhibits. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the visible woman or the visible man. Anyone come across this yet? Um, that's a very popular exhibit. Uh, this one is actually one from the Dresden Medical Museum and it's a replica of a woman that renders the internal biological reality of the human body visible. So if you go there you can push different buttons and the liver for instance will just illuminate and you will see where the liver in the body is. There are also versions where you have removable transluctant outer shells that you can open up um, so all of these are of course highly normative and most of the time these are uh, white, young, able-bodied or non-disabled uh, adults that are depicted. So in our endeavor to know and understand the body, we seem to cling on to the visual mode as epistemological anchor. Realizing just how much we use images to understand the body, I argue that rather than a mere critique of medical practices, the popularity of graphic illness and disability narratives is based on medicine's very reliance on visual culture. I think it's important to stress here that I do not want to label this a bad development. So I don't want to speak against comics. I actually love comics. Uh -huh. I love reading um, comics. But I think I, I really, what I really want to do is to emphasize the fact that graphic narratives, rather than being this new innovative form, um, they are praised for. They are really a logical consequence of how medicine operates and tries to generate knowledge. Yet, as all forms of representation, visual negotiations of the body are, of course, also flawed. Um, there will always be, to borrow from Ferdinand Saussure here, be a gap between the signifier and the signified, no matter whether we employ a visual mode or a textual mode of communication. And this is something Ian Williams actually points out in a different way, but he says this on the Graphic Medicine website, but it seems to get lost in translation somehow because 
it does not really receive much attention in other writing in graphic medicine so far. Last but not least, what these visual means of representing the body and the general enthusiasm for graphic illness and disability narratives reveal is a not-so-hidden ocular centrism that underlies graphic medicine, medical practice, and the production of knowledge in these fields. By creating the impression that instead of reading about patients' experiences, more or deeper knowledge can be gained by looking at the images of graphic memoirs, scholars in graphic medicine seem to reinforce the false understanding of seeing as knowing further invoking the misperception that seeing is necessarily the normal way of gathering knowledge. And this is a misperception that, of course, scholars like David Bolt um, or Georgina Cleach have revealed to be a culturally, construct, uh, culturally constructed rather than being a given fact. Employing the concepts put forward by David Bolt a little further here, we can note that the popularity of graphic narratives of disability and illness <coughs> relies on both a normative positivism as well as a non-normative negativism about disability. In the case of graphic medicine, normative positivism overemphasizes the merits of visual representations of illness and disability, while non-normative negativism enforces the assumption that visual representation and thus vision is a necessary condition to only understand uh, to not only understand but also to emotionally relate to stories of illness and disability this does not only reveal the ocular centrism that underlies some of the basic assumptions in graphic medicine but as a disabled consequence of ocular centrism hints at what David Bolt has called ocular normativism. Tracing the history of medicine, and I'm very interested in history as you might notice, uh, such contemporary display of ocular normativism seems actually rather striking because when we read Michel Foucault's The Order of Things we will learn that sight indeed becomes already questioned as a source of anatomical knowledge in the 19th century. So at the same time that visualization becomes a more central means of diagnosis uh, and study uh, throughout this time, it's also already questioned at a, as a source of knowledge. Last but not least, I would like to come back to a brilliant point that Ryan Perry made in the previous talk of the seminar series about the gain of not knowing. Leaning on the tradition and importance of medical illustrations and medical education, the use of comics and graphic medicine seems to suggest a familiar way of knowledge production. So a little bit along the lines, okay, medical students, first we look at the images in your anatomy book, and then you know everything about the body, and afterwards you look at autobiographical comics, and then you know all, everything about illness and disability experiences. So we can check both of the list. And I'm exaggerating a little bit here on purpose just to, to point out the potential flaws that this approach might have. The question that I believe is worth considering is, how important is it for us at the university to teach students, medical students, but also disability studies students alike to not know and to embrace moments of not knowing in productive ways in their future careers. While it is a philosophical commonplace that we will never have entire knowledge about the experience and feelings of someone else and thus about embodied experiences of illness and disability, there seems to be a need to emphasize these limits of knowledge in academia. Such a moment of disorientation when instructors embrace not knowing and students are perhaps left a little confused, as Ryan Perry proposes, I think are very, very important moments of learning. So while graphic narratives of illness and disability certainly have their value in medical education, such moments of disorientation might actually be better achieved through forms of literature that do not as closely resemble the usual means of knowledge production in medicine. <coughs>
So perhaps, I don't know, through poetry or some other genre that actually at first glance seems very far removed from what medical students usually encounter. I think that would be a really productive way of creating these moments of disorientation. Um, to conclude, because this was a rather longish talk, I created a list of the main points for our discussion. So, um, my first point was, while many contemporary graphic memoirs about illness and disability playfully engage with their medical aesthetics, they are reluctant to make more of an argument about the relationship between their form and disability. Second, due to their medium and their specific narrative focus, graphic illness and disability memoirs further draw attention to and run the risk of exploiting the visuality of disability. The third point, readers are culturally trained to derive pleasure from looking at pictures of pain, disability and illness. These images, particularly if they are extreme, reassure the non-disabled reader of their carefully constructed status as normate. Thus, this process forms one of the bases for the general success of graphic illness and disability narratives in today's book market. Number four, rather than being a radically new way of representing illness and disability experiences, the success of graphic illness and disability narrative in medical education is based on medicine's general reliance on visual culture. And last but not least, despite its appreciation of disability experiences and its complex mediation of such experiences, graphic medicine's basic claims about the value of comics in medical education seem to be underpinned by ocular centrism and ocular normativism. Novativism. Thank you <laughs> very much.